professor of biochemistry at the Stanford University Medical Center. In 1980, he won the Nobel Prize for recombining DNA, engineering the very stuff of creation. However, his interest in creativity goes beyond science. This stuff enters into it and it breaks the relationship. Nathan Oliveira is one of Berg's friends at Stanford. Oliveira has been a vital force in American art for almost 30 years as a painter, master printmaker, sculptor, and teacher. And a whole series of questions and then having to follow that off. I think I remember the first time I saw some of your work, the thing that intrigued me most was the sense of mystery about the images. It drew me into the whole subject, trying to figure out what the subject matter was about. And in a sense, it was very much the way I look at some scientific questions, it's the scientific problems. When I hear of something that uh, has just occurred or somebody has made a discovery, you begin to ask all kinds of questions about what it means. It has a sense of mystery about it and draws you into it. And to that extent, the kind of work that you were doing and the kind of science that I was doing had a very, very strong similarity to it. Well, this might be very true. I, you see, because I, rather than preconceiving concepts, an idea about a painting, I find the idea of the painting through the process of making that painting. Actually, what happens is that if I have an idea to start with, say in monotype, I make marks on the metal plate, and as I continue to add more marks and erase marks, suddenly there's a suggestion of a concept. And once that suggestion is strong enough, I will follow that, that suggestion, that, that potential. Well, sometimes we tear up the results and say, well, the experiment was a failure. I suspect that must be... Oh, yes, many. <laughs> <laughs> many of them uh, are torn up because they weren't that pleasant a surprise. There's an element of chance involved, and that's, that's exciting. I know that on many occasions, uh, we've set out to do one kind of experiment. In conceiving that experiment, we've had to devise a new approach to asking that question. In actually executing that new approach, we turned up a totally new kind of observation, a new discovery, right. unanticipated. Probably never had done before because people hadn't done the experiment in that way. Right. So either the block here or there, oftentimes when I go to the lab, having come up with some notion while shaving or showering, we'll want to discuss it with some of the people in the lab. You did experiments like this, this Alfred, where you were trying to find the optimal concentration. Yeah, but what I found was G alone wouldn't overcome a micro block. Right, then actually they can do X. Well, difficulty with the GPT selection varies between cell lines a lot. With cell cells, CB1 cells, it's particularly difficult to kill them. A new perspective gets injected, and a whole new idea begins to emerge and becomes more and more exciting. That's the difference between, I think, the way I do science and the way you do art. You're more solitary in a sense. And well, but still, when I have an idea going into the studio, that's just the start because even though I don't have colleagues that are waiting for me to modify the idea, I go through that modification process myself and end up somewhere other than where I started. Does that surprise you at the end of the day when you step back and look and see what, what came out at the end of the day? It, isn't anything like what you started with in the morning? If it's a good day, I, I relish it. Because yeah. that's what I really look forward to. If it's a bad day, it's not too happy. I remember seeing a film about you making a painting name. What struck me was how many times you painted over the image that you had just created. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to myself, how is he going to know when it's finished? Mm -hmm. What if he thinks the third figure was better than the one he's at now, the sixth. Right. How can he get back to it? I trust my intuition in telling me when things are right and when they're wrong, but it's not always true. But I have to follow it. When I get a kind of signal from the painting, there's a rightness about it. It has a sense of presence, and I'm convinced that it's able to live on its own. In my kind of work, uh, it's not so much knowing when something is done, because scientific experiment is never finished. It only opens new questions that yes. you have to go on to. 
Our problem is knowing what directions to go. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, in particular, back in 1967, when I decided to shift the direction of my work, my mentor and one of my most trusted friends and critics told me he thought I was making a terrible mistake, that I was wasting my talent by changing the direction of our research, and that, in fact, I would probably end up losing the momentum and the progress that we had made over several years. And it turned out that, in fact, the time was ripe to make that change. And we launched a new direction. I think the work has blossomed. It has opened new areas for many others to work in. And in that particular case, the final judgment really had to come from my own criticism. Right. And what others say about what we do may influence us, but in the end, it's our own guts our that own. tell us what's important and what we have to do. It's a combination of our own guts, our own nose, and our own ability to criticize ourselves according to our own lives. This feeling of knowing when something is right, something that young people really have to develop the hard way. Mm -hmm. I remember as a student myself, I somehow expected that I would gain enough of the technique that once I conquered it, a painting technique, that I could then just simply paint things. <laughs> I didn't realize that uh, the technique was just a small part of, of being an artist and that one had to then develop ideas. I don't think we really speak about creativity. We speak about a process of thinking that leads us to find, into to finding things that are important. And, uh, and that can be applied in almost any level. I think from a grade school child and uh, through a businessman through aeronautical engineers. Oh, that looks neat. And I've also tried another post, and again, I'm getting plaques. We get very ambitious people coming to work with us. They want to make their mark. They often make me begin to think and read in areas in which I'm totally ignorant. I can act as a sounding board for their ideas. I can stimulate them, encourage them, but it's their drive and their energy and their imagination that often makes some of the projects go in the lab. Well, that's part of creative thinking. It isn't, again, so solely independent. Mm -hmm. it, there's so much of it is, depends on the environment or mm -hmm. the ambience that, that surrounds you. An environment for me means being exposed to work of other artists or people. Mm -hmm. And that's the way many things come about. It's simply a, not a matter of sitting down at a desk and inventing an idea that I'm going to do this or that. But suddenly there's a motivating force that comes about either directly or indirectly, that enthuses you, that inflames your, your curiosity, your, your notions, your, your, your ambitions. Again, it, life is made up of these high and kind of low points, and this is one of the high points, so mm -hmm. to speak. I keep trying to tell the students about what it's like to achieve that high and how infrequently that happens. And, likely they're going to have to work a large part of their life without ever having experience, but when it comes, it's worth it.